Welcome, everybody. This is the Life Enthusiast Online TV and Radio Network, restoring vitality to you and the planet. I'm your co-host, Scott Patton, and joining us, as usual, is my co-host, a good friend, Martin Patella, Life Enthusiast Health Coach. Hey, Martin, how are you doing today? Hello, Scott. I am actually, well, personally, I'm happy to be alive. I have been operated on, and so I'm in pain. If you see me grimacing, it's going to be that. But, but it's okay. I'm getting better. I have had a minor operation. Praise Lord for the uh, medical system being available to me when I needed it. Yeah, absolutely. So what's been happening? One of the things that's been happening in the world is a ton of fires. In British Columbia, where we live, there's, it's, it was uh, awful in the summertime. And then when I thought like the fire season was over, it just moved south to California and things were blowing up like unbelievable in that area. And Martin, I can't help but think like when we talk about health, we're usually talking about, you know, what you drink and what you eat and not as much about what you breathe. But when you have all of this very, very fine ash in the air and you're breathing it, that's going to cause problems down the road, won't it? Oh, gosh, yes. There are two issues with the particulate stuff in the air, right? One is, one is the little charcoal bits that get in the air, and they're microscopic, but they are quite sharp. They're edgy. And so you could get with a small microscopic bit of carbon embedded in your lung tissue, and it's just like hitting a sliver in your lungs. And that's not fun because your body doesn't know how to get rid of it. It will try and encapsulate it. There could be all manner of trouble coming from that. <sighs> but the other part, of course, is the irritation. It may be causing mild allergic issues and asthmatic issues for sure. So vulnerable people are always under stress, right? We will be dealing with the, either the very young infants or the very old or anyone who has breathing conditions, they will be seriously impacted. So that, that you'll, you'll see that on all the government sites. They'll tell you, protect yourself. Number one, don't go out if you don't have to. Number two, if you do have to, don't do serious exertion exercise where you have to breathe with your mouth wide open. Um, all, the, all the logical things, right? Behave smart. So before we get in, into this any further, as you were talking, I was thinking about all of the, and I don't know if they're Japanese or Chinese, tourists that I have seen in, in different cities who, when they come to visit, they have this white mask over their face. And I'm just thinking like, do you think that's a good idea? Do you think it actually does stop some of the particulates getting into the lungs? I'm kind of thinking it's like, putting a Band-Aid on your knee when you've got a, a sore on your elbow, personally? Um, well, I wouldn't go that far, but I would say that they are trying to... Well, okay, the, the white masks that we see are practically useless against the uh, smoke from the forest fire. They are really good to protect you from being coughed at and protecting you from getting saliva from another person on your face which may or may not be a good thing. Personally, I'm a strong believer in making my immune system strong and, and not worrying about if somebody's going to cough on me or not. Right. So yeah, I'm uh, cynical about that white little mask. It helps, you know, especially, especially the ones that are tight enough that will filter out the uh, particulates. They, they might be useful, but I doubt that the typical painter mask that they are running around with is going to do a lot of good. Right. I mean, it's like anything else. If, you, if you're going to be getting one of the top of the line uh, mask filters, okay, but it's quite likely that they, they bought it at the, at the dollar store, right? Yeah. I think it's a symbolic gesture that gives them some level of emotional comfort. Yeah, as a, well, and you know, that's, but that's like, it's an important thing to think about because we have a lot of beliefs. And when we believe that we're in a safe place, we act a lot differently than when we think, well, maybe this isn't very safe. And 
just because you believe it's safe doesn't mean that it isn't is safe i mean and just because you think it's not safe doesn't mean that it's maybe as dangerous as you think and i'm a firm believer in, in what you've brought up martin in that if we are sterilizing everything so much then we're not really doing a favor to ourselves i mean a hundred years ago you know kids were playing in the sand and in the dirt and sticking it in their mouth and they were getting all the the good bacteria and everything that was helping plants grow, so to speak. And of course now it's like you're on a, a bleached tile floor and you know, take that out of your mouth and all these sort of things that uh, don't cause us to naturally build up our immune system. And right. you know, if, you, if you get a cold or you get a flu, the reason that they don't worry about that flu virus again is because your body has developed uh, immune, immunity to it. And I want to talk about Zika for a second because it just popped into my head. Zika was this awful virus that was going to go around the world and destroy everybody. And we were going to have babies with weird heads and all the rest of it. So three or four big pharma companies went out and made virus, uh, sorry, vaccines for the virus. And then they wanted to test it. So they said, great, we're going to go into Zika territory and we're going to do uh, take the blood out. We're going to see how many anti-Zika uh, red blood cells or antibodies you've got then we're going to give you the the vaccine and we're going to see how many more you've got and then we're going to see if we can get to where we're really confident that you're not going to get the zika virus uh the, the sickness from the v zika virus right so evidently there is a number that when you have this many of this type of antibody the zika virus will not uh, make you sick for your baby they could not find one person that they could give the vaccine to because all of them had enough antibodies to fight off the Zika, like whatever the antibody was to fight off the Zika vax, the Zika virus. So let me, let me just weigh in on that, please. Which is this, the people that were getting sick were malnourished, poisoned people in Brazil. The, the statistical sample of the people who were getting really ill were weakened, toxic, uh, undernourished people with broken immune systems. That's what, what that's who was getting sick. If you if you try to uh, uh, make a, a healthy person sick with the Zika virus, you just already said it. The immune system is strong enough to deal with it. Yeah. So we need to work on our immune system is the message that we're trying to give you. So, so let me, let me just say that. Not gonna help it. Yeah, let me just address that in the following manner. It's a lot like exercise. If you want to maintain your physical ability, agility, flexibility, and strength, you need to um, push against resistance. You need to actually work it, exercise. Because if you're going to just lay down and sit back and do nothing, within not that long, you're going to atrophy. And that's what will happen to the immune system if you do not expose it to things that it needs to actually apply itself against, you're going to make it weaker. Hence, I allow people to sneeze on me. Instead, I just support my immune system from within. All right. Hope okay, so let's get back to the fires. Right, the fires. So there is this physical acute danger, right? Like if you are in a smog, smoke, particulate filled air, you definitely need to be rational. You need to be not doing stupid things and causing yourself to be poisoned by it immediately. However, there's more to it than that. There's the, there's the chronic, the long term, the, the general exposure to um, to what has been burned. And I, I just see it as four different categories. You're burning the forest or the orchard. You're burning a house, home. You're burning a car. You're burning an industrial installation of some sort. So if I were to describe it. So first of all, with the forest, there have been years and years and years of rain, 
falling onto these forests. Whatever has been deposited into the air that has rained down onto the forest is in the forest floor, is probably been absorbed into the trees. So if there was radioactive fallout from something, or if there was some other chemical pollution or whatever else, other toxicity that has been pushed up into the air, for example, 50,000 tons of mercury is put into the air every year. Well, it rains down on the world. So if it rained down on that forest, now that mercury is in that forest. When you burn that forest, it goes back up into the air. For example, right? So don't think that, oh, it's just like a campfire, no big deal, we're just burning a few sticks. It's not a big deal. It is a big deal because the toxicity of the planet itself is being recirculated back up. It's the opposite of filtering. It's the re-exposure. The opposite of filtering. That's such a good way to put it. <laughs> We're just piling on more mercury and aluminum and all these other chemicals that we're creating yeah. and putting it up into the air for us to breathe in. Mercury doesn't, it, uh, you, you don't normally get rid of it. Uh, it's quite a bit different than a virus, right? This isn't something that's going to improve your immune system when you expose yourself to it. And we're going to be seeing lots of, uh, you know, mental problems coming out of this because that's one of the things that mercury does. Yes, it's tragic and it affects many things. So that, so that burning the forest itself or the field itself is not innocent. Then, then let me just mention burning a car. What does that do, right? You're burning the paint. That's, that's a um, um, pretty volatile organic compound that isn't friendliest to the existence of a healthy human. You're burning the tires, similar idea. And then you're burning the plastic, you know, the bumper and uh, maybe the plastic body parts, whatever that is. And then you get inside the car, you're burning the seats and the stuffing, upholstery and who knows what else and the dashboard. So there's a lot of weird chemicals being burned, stuff you're not allowed to burn. Right? Like normally, I'm not supposed to take my old furniture and burn it in the garden to get rid of. And yet, here I am, burning it. Yeah, we don't go and uh, take all the old tires and burn them. We put them off in the field somewhere and hope that the sun doesn't start them on fire, but we, we store them. And you don't take your car to, uh, uh, you take it to a crusher, you don't take it to a place where they, you know, melt it all down and burn it all up. Right. And when you're burning it, you want to burn it in, uh, with a temperature that's high enough to actually frack all the chemicals into its constituent components, rather than just the semi-burned things that are going to uh, linger in the atmosphere. So it's not innocent and it puts out all kinds of chemicals in the air. And we won't necessarily know the impact those chemicals have immediately because they're, they're long-term, they're in the body for long-term, they work long-term. They don't. Yeah. These are trace amounts that go into the air, and these trace amounts will be accumulating in all of us slowly. And they'll be accumulating in the cattle that's grazing on the meadow that's downwind from this fire, and then we'll butcher the cattle and we turn it into hamburger, and then we'll eat that and recycle again and again. So burning a house is somewhat similar to that. There are all kinds of materials like for example treated wood the, the you know arsenic and sulfur and who knows what else that's been applied to the wood to make it not rot quickly well now that you're burning it you're putting all of that chemical soup in the air and of course the furniture that was in it and all the paint that was in it and all the uh, appliances that you're burning I mean, it's a complex chemical toxic soup that's going up into the air when you're burning a house or an office. 
And we just have to look across the street to know that it didn't go anywhere, right? Like, it's what you're breathing. Yeah, well, it did go up in the air, and it's being washed downwind somewhere. So, like, you might be somewhere in Minnesota snickering how the Californians got it hard. Well, <laughs> we just sent you the jet stream full of this stuff to, to cope with. So it's complicated. And then, of course, the industrial things like the old transformers. They have used PCBs to, uh, uh, um, what's the word, in the coolants. You know, the, the oil that has been used to cool the uh, transformers has in it toxic elements that are no longer used, but the old transformers are still installed. So when you burn them, cause them to blow up and burn, um, now it's all in the air again. Anyway, I just wanted to lay it out in multiple layers of there's a lot of undesirable stuff in the air. now. And so every time there is a forest fire or a city fire or whatever fire, up it goes. Expect more trouble rather than less. So I would like to say, well, let's not just gloom and doom all over it so terribly. I would like to say this. In an acute situation, it is wonderful to have an air filter device on hand. We do offer the air pura filters on our website, and we have a filter configuration for every situation, whether it's for a typical household with pollen uh, concerns or with pet dander concerns or a medical office with... Uh, chemical smells concern or, or an automotive repair shop with uh, petroleum and who knows what exhaust concerns. There's a configuration for every situation. So these are highly efficient, high value products. No, they're not the cheapest. They start at about $600 and go up to maybe $1,200, which is not your typical two or $300 home filter but they are worth it. They do deliver. They're not just recirculating things around. So if you have an acute problem, consider one of those. For a chronic problem, we have it in our environment. We need to support our body to be able to detox itself. We need to support the uh, skin detox and the lung detox and the urine detox and the uh, fecal detox. All of the pathways need to be running well to uh, get rid of things that we need to get rid of. Oof. So of course, heavy metals. We talked about heavy metals in our history many times. I find the zeolites to be really effective because they are so innocent, so easily administered and yet quite effective especially cost effective. And then we have found that uh, humic acid and fulvic acid are really helpful to the body to get rid of things. We can probably point to a page on our website where they are, but look, you can look up humic, that's spelled H-U-M-I-C, or fulvic, F-U-L-V-I-C. Those things are wonderful. MSM supports detox pathways really well. Everything that's toxic in your body before it can be safely eliminated needs to be methylated. And the methylated sulfur supports the methylation in your liver and then getting rid of these toxins. So consider that. No, I think the fulvic and humic acid along with the zeolite are, are probably the best interior cleaners that you can get because they will just get right into the cell or right into the blood and they'll just clump on to the particles that are not good and take them right and basically neutralize them and then take them right out of the system yeah yeah one other thing that's probably worth mentioning is this the a lot of the organic compounds the volatile organic petrochemicals that get into you are fat soluble so they will be sequestered, pushed aside into your body fat. Or actually the body puts them into places of slow circulation or low circulation. 
So this could be your either body fat or your cartilage, your bones, and your brain. So you want to have something in your body that's going to help to move these things around. And the thing that does that is an emulsifier, lecithin. Well, actually, phosphatidylcholine is the one that you want to use, but lecithin is loaded with it. So that's what we want to have. Supplement with lecithin. It's such a baseline element. Its, it's function is so important in the body. And then sweat a lot. Sweating is a wonderful means of getting rid of things. So if you do that through exercise or sauna, that's great. Or if you don't have access to that, get a, one of the biomats, the heated uh, electric blankets that cause your body to heat up when you lay on it. Make yourself sweat. If you can do it through exercise, it's the best. If you are not as mobile as that, then do it through other means. And drink good water. Good water, yes. Structured, energized water. Very helpful. Yeah, you don't want to be drinking water that's full of all the things that uh, went into the air and came down as rainwater, in the rainwater. Yeah, you definitely want to have it filtered. So for that, we do have some, uh, some uh, supplements. Uh, Dutoxicel, which is a uh, sulfur-based water detoxifier. Um, the Adya Minerals, you know, the rock extract type of water filtering chemical. I mean, it's just an additive. You add it to the water and it agglutinates whatever is dissolved in the water and causes it to curdle out of solution and settle down to the bottom so you can avoid it, filter it out. You can actually see it when you, <laughs> when you put a couple of drops in your water, then a, few, a little while later, you're gonna be able to see what was in your water that isn't anymore. It looks like clouds, it looks like snow in your water for a while and then it settles to the bottom. So we have all of these available on the website. Of course, you can uh, con contact us and get specific uh, information if you want. I, I guess I was just thinking when you were talking about the water, we don't use a straw. Um, <laughs> if you oh, yeah, put all that stuff on the bottom, right? You yes. can it up. <laughs> yeah. It would be best to use a filter, right? But if yeah. you don't have a filter, you can still drop it in the water and just use the top two thirds or three quarters of the volume and leave the murky stuff at the bottom. Yeah, don't drink it. So Martin, if somebody wanted to know more about this, like we haven't obviously done an exhaustive uh, discussion of everything that, that can go on from the fires and the, and the environment to your own personal environment, but if they wanted to know more about this, how can they get a hold of you? Um, easily accessible at life-enthusiast.com by phone at 1-866-543-3388. I actually have another thought. I wanted to uh, get on a rant about global warming. Do we have time to talk about that? Sure, sure. Let's talk about global warming. I hate the term. When we're I hate the term because I think it's total mislabeled the situation. Because it's not about warming, it's about extreming. When we put more carbon dioxide and methane into the air, what happens is the um, extremes are accentuated. We have more summer and more winter at the same time. We have less spring and less fall. The summer is more intense and the winter is more intense. So you will have crazy storms in the summer and you have crazy snowfalls in the winter and, and, and so on. That's what we have. Extreming, we should have called it, rather than yes. whatever it is that we pick. But it's a difficult word to pick. I don't know. Maybe somebody can come up with a better term, but calling it global warming is making it easily exposed to people who want to make fun of it. They can point at the, well, what about the winter? What happened to your global warming sun? Look at the snowstorm that's just freezing the Northeast. Well, it's the other side of that same creature. 
you had more extreme on the summer side and more extreme on the winter side. So uh, I would like to say that I don't think that humans are the only cause for the uh, rising levels of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere. Like for example, methane is the uh, swamp gas in cow farts. So yes, <laughs> it's, there's more of it and the global warming or global extreming is proceeding because of that. Help me here. I'm getting a little brain freeze on where I was getting headed with this thought. <laughs> well, you said it wasn't just the humans, and you then you blamed the cows. And I thought, well, there's a lot of cows because us humans are raising them to eat them. So uh, that's kind of an indirect result. Yes, you're right but, about that. Uh, when I think of the global warming issue, I, th I also think it's a crazy label because the problem, in my opinion, is we're not looking after the planet. And so if we spend all this time arguing about whether it's warming or cooling or whatever, we stop thinking about the fact that uh, our cities are so full of garbage that they're looking at trucking the garbage hundreds of miles away. Our seas are filling up with plastics and every time uh, a whale comes ashore and they cut it open to see what's wrong, they find it's full of plastic. So we're just, we're just creating this massive garbage pit and we're not thinking about what, you know, so we have these manufacturers that manufacture, they sell, and then they think, oh, we're done. And so they look for the cheapest, the, the fastest, the easiest way to go, which typically is petroleum product type stuff, which lasts forever. I mean, when you think back to the 40s and 50s, that was what they were selling. They were selling a wrap that you're a, a package you could put around something and it would never break down because everything was always breaking down. But now we're at the point where we have so much stuff that doesn't break down that we're choking on it. Yeah, you're right. And we need yeah. to look at how, you know, how can we make something that's a keep something safe or packages nice, and then when we're done with it, we'll just sort of decompose and feed the plants. That would be, you know, what I would hope for. Mm -hmm. That would be nice. Yeah, so, yeah, you're saying it right. The externalization of consequences, right? The manufacturer gets to keep the profit, but unloads the consequences to the greater society. So then the consumer in general, through the government, has to deal with the consequence. The, right. classic, the classic plunder uh, technology. We extract the gold from the mine and leave the settling pond behind. Who cares? That's full of cyanide. Who cares that it poisons 10 rivers and uh, generations of people afterwards? Or nuclear power plant. Oh, well, who's to worry about the fact that I don't know how many miles of terrain are now polluted for 20,000 years? Yeah. Yeah, the sad part of it is, is that we're not creating... like. A thousand years ago, when we created a mess, a couple hundred years later, it was all grown over and who cared? Nobody knew, right? Yes. Now we create a mess and it's not a thousand years for it to get cleaned up. It's 20,000 or 100,000 or however long plutonium takes. And, uh, you know, so we're really causing long-term problems. Like, where are we going to be in 20 years? Uh, you know, on one side, you've got things that suggest, wow, it could be utopia. And the other, you got, oh, my goodness no one's going to be able to survive. And, uh, right, so we need to come up with solutions and we need to come up with changes pretty quickly. And uh, I, I mean, I'm aware of one of the wonderful solutions that a friend of mine has uh, through thermolysis, where he's able to, uh, in this piece of equipment, convert anything that's got organic material in it into innocent, reusable, high-value char, carbon and yet is that, let, let's just say is that is not dirt right no no that's not dirt that's the humus the, the part of soil that uh, that you desire the most the stuff that plants love to convert back into more plants so it, it converts it into something that is the best part of dirt yes that's correct and yet he's having the hardest time getting financing ah. anyway that would be another long rant so about this 
climate issue. I would like to implore everyone to make their footprint smaller and consider the consequences of leaving stuff behind. It's important because we are going to run into the capacity. I don't know if we have already overrun it or not. I think, I think for the population that's on the planet, we need about two and a half planets to keep it running at the rate we're going. Otherwise, it's going to just run into a significant crash. Oh, yeah, it's definitely going that way. And uh, what was interesting was an article I read about a month ago, which suggested that we, these, these big plastic uh, masses in the ocean, a lot of it is coming from uh, Eastern Asia. So China, Vietnam, Philippines, Southeast Asia, that area. And when I was in Kenya, I was in Mombasa, and I was, there's a be there are beautiful beaches on the Indian Ocean. And it was really interesting walking on, these, on the beach because I'm looking at the sand and everywhere I go, there's little pieces of plastic. You know, the plastic has been ground up and it's, you know, in the sand. It's not like, oh, there's a Coke can here that somebody left. It was like, no, there was, you know, there was like Coke bottles that had been crushed up and chopped into teeny weeny pieces. Okay. And and, and put into the, like, it's the beach. It's part of the beach. Yeah, it was plastic confetti in, in the sand, right? That's right. And I was just, and it was just, like, full of it. Like, and in, in 10 years, there won't be sand. It'll just be the plastic that pretends it's sand. And when I was in Costa Rica, as a, as a contrast, a few months later, there was nothing but sand on the beach. Like, I was actually shocked, right? But it seems like everything goes west so the, that part of the pollution from uh, uh, asia didn't hit those beaches and i guess it didn't come down from the states and hit those beaches because that would be where most of it would come from i would right. think um but yeah, I mean, was, like, yeah pristine sand and then boy this is what the new beach is going to look like and it was a real shock yeah i think these pieces are carried by the ocean currents right so yes. you do understand where the currents are where they come from where they're headed that's where it's going to end up. Yeah. And, yeah. and in this particular case, the currents go away from the land and from, you know, so if it was coming towards Costa Rica, well, it just goes away and it doesn't hit them, right? So, yeah. uh, but what's interesting is Costa Rica has really revved up. It's all like we're green. We're all about uh, renewable resources and, and not, you know, recycling. And I mean, they're just massively into this whole movement. And uh, it's quite interesting because a lot of the, the a lot of the cities that are in towns that I was in where you would normally expect to see a lot of just garbage laying around nor, like if you walk down your street and look down and just see how much garbage there is I have a friend who said I never thought my city was dirty until I walked my dog and my dog is constantly picking up and chewing on something that I have to take out of his mouth because he's going to eat this plastic thing right um, but you'd be shocked. And in Costa Rica, I have to say, I didn't notice, I can't say that I was specifically looking and inspecting, but I really didn't notice any garbage on the streets. It just seemed like everybody was picking up after themselves, and had bought into this whole, you know, we're this jungle paradise. And so we need to keep it nice. Yes, so it's possible to educate an entire nation. So here's That's our message. Here's our contribution. We're trying to convince you that you need to clean up after yourself. That's right. Well, then on that cheery note. Yeah, we have, we have polluted beaches and we have unpolluted beaches and we have people that throw stuff overboard and we have people that pick up after themselves. So we want you to be one of the people that picks up after themselves. And that's the start. You know, I have friends that they'll take a garbage bag and go down to the beach and they'll pull it. A garbage bag off the beach and take a picture and share it on social media and tag hashtag it and say you know I did it can you do it too and other ones that'll just walk the beach and they love it and if they see it you know some cans or something they'll pick it up and take it off so there's whether you're helping a little bit or you're helping a lot uh, it makes a difference and what are you teaching your children if they see you pick up they're gonna think oh that's normal behavior 
Yeah, interesting that you're mentioning that. My wife and I, we go for walks and we pack a bag with us and uh, we usually fill one or two shopping bags of stuff every time we go. It's usually the worst around bus stops. Yeah. People just leave whatever they were holding and just drop it and move on. Aye, aye, aye. Yeah, so there needs to be education, right? And, and you know, we're, we're kind of like two guys in the wilderness, uh, you know, shouting out our message and we need you to share the, this show and we need you to share with your friends and we need you to talk to your school teachers who are teaching your children and the principals and your congressmen and senators and whoever else you can talk to and say, like, we need to do something about this problem. And it's not a, it's, it's a problem with the, what the people are manufacturing and it's also a problem with what people are buying and it's also a problem with what the people are doing with the stuff after they finish buying it. And we really need to change the way we look at things and stop being all this, uh, you know, just total consumer consumption, uh, rampant consumer consumption, right, for no reason. Do you need seven cars in your garage? Probably not. Probably not. Well, that, that's a separate issue. That's a, a, affordable or not affordable. Some people have enough money to do it. Let them have their uh, fun that way. The issue for me is that we are going to run into the consequences of this mindset. It's getting closer and closer. The metaphor I carry in my head is... Uh, Visualize a pond, and on the pond we have water lilies, and they're growing on the pond, and they're doubling in coverage every day. Now, in 30 days, the pond will be completely covered. At 29, at 29 days, it's half covered. At 28 days, it's quarter covered. It's 27 days, it's an eighth covered. You still have 80 something, 88% clear at that point. So that's what I'm trying to tell you is, but when you notice it, it is going to go like flash toward crazy. Yeah, so in other words, we don't have a lot of time. Yeah, that's correct. You think you do, but you don't. No. We don't. Well, dear dear people, listeners, Life Enthusiast Co-op and Martin and Scott, we are um, trying to restore vitality to you and to the planet. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for listening. Thank you for uh, stopping by the website, life-enthusiast.com. And if you have a question you want to ask me, call 866-543-3388. Scott, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Martin. Look forward to seeing you all next time. Bye-bye.